Leslie. Fabulous. Thank you. And everybody give Leslie a big shout out um, for what she's done. All right. So good to see all of you. Uh, welcome to the last Thursday of the semester. Um, we're going to continue our, our reading of Foucault, specifically uh, part three, chapters one, two, three. And today, the, the main part of the, the lecture is going to concern the second strategy and technique of disciplinary power, the architectural and panoptic surveillance. But before we get to that, I just have one or two more words um, or passages to review, things to say about the first strategy. And we spent all Tuesday talking about the first strategy slash technique of disciplinary power, the total sort of control and routinization of space and time. And, and we got right to the beginning of the time part of that. Um, and, and I just want to say a few things because there's some really beautiful things and then we'll move on to what we really need to do today. Um, and with respect to Foucault's idea that in the Enlightenment, you, you have the emergence of this, this kind of obsession with the control and routinization of space and time. With respect to the time part, there are really two important things about the time part. Uh, the first one is what we started to talk about on Tuesday, and, and that's the most obvious, that time becomes uh, a kind of an obsession. And, and, and not, not just an obsession, but, but time, how do I wanna say this? Time becomes formalized, right? In the Enlightenment, you, you literally get the emergence of clocks. You get the emergence of watches. You get the emergence of clocks. And, and you get the emergence of clocks and watches because there is this obsession with, with, with controlling time, with marking, with marking time, controlling time. You, you, you literally get the emergence of what is now ubiquitous, the clock. What is now ubiquitous, the watch. I mean, prior to the Enlightenment, I suppose people had clocks. Many working people didn't. Nobody had watches. Only the aristocracy, the very wealthy, had watches. Um, only the wealthy had clocks and homes. Clocks and homes didn't exist, right, until industrialization and basic mechanization technology emerged in the 1800s, 1900s, right? Um, and so there wasn't, there was time, obviously there was time, sun comes up, it's morning, get a little hungry, it's lunchtime, sun goes down, it's evening. I, there was, of course there was time, I get that, I'm not saying there was no time, but there wasn't time as we conceive of it, which is just, fa it's so fucking fascinating, I find there wasn't time as we conceive it, and we conceive it on the clock. We conceive it in 12 hours, in the 24 hour cycle, on um, the second and the minute, and the hour and the day, and that's how we conceive it. Time has become organized, it has become routinized, it becomes formalized, and, and you get this emergence of the obsession with time. And the second big thing that, that happens, and we'll read some passages here, um, is, is the fusion, and this is the really deep one, the fusion of time and activity. The fusion and, and the fusion of space, time, and activity, those three things. Um, and so, again, let's just look at a few passages um, and, then, and then we'll move on. So, middle of page 150. Again, just, just some passages gesturing to this formalization of time that emerges in the in the Enlightenment. And by the way, we saw this way back in chapter one, right? The first four pages of the book open with that grotesque torture and, and, and execution of Damien. And then the, the narrative stops abruptly and, and Foucault just narrates the schedule, the boys home, right? The, the book, literally the narrative goes directly to this schedule. Right, six o'clock you wake up. Six fifteen you brush your teeth. Six thirty you put your clothes on. Six forty-five you meet for breakfast. Six forty seven o'clock you go to prayer. Eight o'clock 
whatever, right? Time, but the, the ordering and the scheduling of time and the linking of time to space. This is what you're doing. This is where you are and what you're doing in every segment of time. And, and this is unique because this emerges in the enlightenment and it's a key element in disciplinary power. And it's a key element in disciplinary powers, capacity to construct the types of subjects, the type of people that we are. And, and again, as we've been kind of having some fun with, we don't even need to go very far to see that. You and I are people, are our schedule obsessed people, right? That's what it means to be self-disciplined. That's what it means to be successful. That's what it means to have moral virtue. I'm, I'm well organized, I'm on time, I'm never late, I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm extracting all the value, all the utility out of time. I'm getting more out of time, I'm more productive, I'm more valuable, right? right? We're, we're, we're extracting every quantum element of time, right? This, this is us, right? And so on the middle of page 50, Foucault writes, and, ju and just talking about the emergence of time, Foucault writes, in the elementary schools, right? So, so again, this happens in the prison, right? The prisoner's life is, is structured by time, right? And, and, and this is schools and hospitals and factories, right? Every, every three minutes, another part of the car comes and you got to, you got, you know, temporal, temporal activity. And so Foucault writes, right in the middle of page 150, in the elementary schools, the division of time, right? The division of time became increasingly minute, right? Activities were governed in detail by orders that had to be to obeyed immediately. And, and, and he's quoting, he's quoting this, this, this passage from LaSalle, talking, this is some guy who's working on this, during this time, he says, at the last stroke of the hour, a pupil will ring the bell. And at the first sound of the bell, all the pupils will kneel with their arms crossed and their eyes lowered. When the prayer has been said, the teacher will strike the second, the signal once to indicate that the pupil should get up. A second signal, a second bell time as a sign that they should salute Christ and a third that they should sit down. In the early 19th century, in the early 1800s, the following timetable was suggested for the schools or mutual improvement schools, right? Entrance, 845, entrance of the monitor. 852, the monitor summons. 856, entrance of the children in prayer. Nine o'clock, the children go to their benches. 904, first slate. 908, end of dictation. 912, second slate, etc. The gradual extension of the wage earning class brought with it a more detailed partitioning of time. So as industrialization emerges, as factories emerge, as mechanized life and production and regulation emerges, the gradual extension of the wage earning class brought with it a more detailed partitioning of time. If workers arrive later than a quarter of an hour after the ringing of the bell, etc. If any one of the companions is asked for during work and loses more than five minutes, etc. Right? So, so there's, this, there's this obsession with the control and routinization of time. And as I was saying in a playful way earlier, but it's an extremely serious point, it, it's not just the control and regulation of time, it's the extraction of time, of, of kind of efficiency, of value out of time. Can you extract more and more work, more and more efficiency, and therefore more and more value out of time, right? And so on the bottom, on the bottom of 150, but an attempt is also made to assure the quality of time used. Constant supervision, the pressure of supervisors, the elimination of anything that might disturb or distract. It is a question of constituting a totally useful time. Man, if there was a, if there was a pathological slogan for late modern 
post-capitalist society, if there was a punchy, playful, heartbreaking slogan for our lives, and I don't mean this in a complimentary way, I mean this in a heartbreaking way. If there was a slogan for our time and what our lives have become, and not just what our lives have become, who we actually are from a postmodern point of view, it would be this line, life is a question of constituting a totally useful time, right? This obsession in capitalism, right? This obsession in scheduling, right? It is expressly forbidden during work to amuse one's companions by gesture, etc. All right. Now, in addition to just time, the second really important thing we have to talk about is the elaboration of time and activity. This is key. The fusing of, of space, time, activity, the bringing together of those three things. Where are you? You're in a particular space, in a particular time, and you're doing a particular activity, right? And, and, and this is really a very deep, deep sort of functioning of disciplinary power because it instills in us a kind of, a kind of automation. It instills in us a kind of habit, a kind of automation, a kind of just learned root behavior space, time, activity, space, time, activity, space, time, activity. And, and, and this first starts in the modern army, right? The origin of this was this attempt in the modern army to teach peasants, right? You want, you want to turn peasants into soldiers. The first thing you kind of do is teach them how to march, right? The first kind of thing you do is to teach peasants who aren't trained, who aren't disciplined, aren't used to following orders, doing what they're told quickly without thinking, quickly without thinking, Right? The, first, the first way in which you start the programming, the transformation of the peasant to the soldier, is you teach him to march, right? Space, step one, two, three, four, 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 step one, two, three, four. And you drill them. For six months, you teach human beings simply how to march. Left, right, one, two, three, four, left, right, one, two, three, four. Right, and it's space, it's time, and it's activity. Space, time, activity. And, 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 and you train it until it becomes automatic, until it becomes, in a, in a weird way, unthinking. And it's the same in the schools. And, and by the way, this was, this was important not just for the military, this was important for industrialization. Right, we were, we were having some fun last week about this whole idea that one of the things that drives the, the emergence of the enlightenment, that drives the emergence of what we will now call disciplinary power is this mass migration of people from, from agricultural work to factory work. And this mass migration from people from the, the, the country to the city. And, and now you have these people you, that, that you need to provide the labor for this, this global first European explosion of industrialization, mechanization factories, right? But these people are uneducated, they're, they're untrained, they're undisciplined, but somehow now you've got to get these people, right? These peasants, these former peasants, you've got to get them to the factory at six in the morning, right? You've got to get them to stand in a fucking box, little, little box for 10 hours. And you got to train them to do the same activity if, if they're building Model T Fords, right? If they're, if, they're, if they're building things, if they're on a factory, if they're on an assembly line, right? you got to get there at seven in the morning. They got to stand there. And every three minutes, another part is coming and they got to rivet on the wheels. And then bang, rivet on the wheels. The fucking end, rivet on the wheels. And they got to do that for 10, 12 hours. Right? You got to get kids who are unruly and, and undisciplined. Got to get them, like we were just said, right, that schedule. Right? And, and, and this, is, this is a massive problem. And this, and, 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 and this, is, this is what is done. This is, this is how you do it. Space, time, activity. Space, time, and activity. And, and, and this routinization of space, time, and activity, the fusion of these three things together, 
creates a kind of consciousness. It creates literally for Foucault, for the postmoderns, it literally structures our consciousness to think of space, time, and activity as intimately intertwined and to become obsessed with it, which we are, our schedules. One fifty one, middle of page one fifty one, the temporal elaboration of the act. There are, for example, two ways of controlling marching troops. In the early seventeenth century, we have a custom soldiers marching in file, or in a battalion to march to the rhythm of the drums. Bam, bam, rhythm, beat, 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 right? And to do this, one must begin with the right foot so that the whole troop raises and so training. Bottom of the page 151. Between these two instructions, a new set of restraints had been brought into play. Another degree of precision in the breakdown of gestures and movements, another way of adjusting the body to time, to temporal imperatives. What the ordinance of 1766 defines is, is not a timetable, it is rather a collective an obligatory rhythm. It's a rhythm. It's a, it's a construction of consciousness. It's a rhythm and movement of life imposed from the outside. It is, it is a program. It assures the elaboration of the act itself. It controls its development and its stages from the inside. A sort of, and one sentence down, here's a beautiful line, a sort of Anatomo chronological schema of behavior is defined. That is you sitting in your same desk, even in different classes, twice a week for 15 weeks. That's what, that's what, that's what we were talking about, that, that joke that we were having fun with that. That's what this has done. You have a space, a time, and an activity. Right, and, 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 it, and it becomes what Foucault calls a sort of anatomo, because it's physical, it's an anatomy, right? You're, you're, you've got a body and you've got a space and you've got a, a time and an activity. A sort of anatomo chronological schema of behavior is defined. The act is broken down into its elements. The position of the body, the limbs, articulation is defined. Each move to each movement are assigned a direction, an aptitude, a duration. Their order of succession is precise. Time, this is and this is beautiful. This is so damn beautiful. Time penetrates the body. Time constructs the mind. Time penetrates the body, and with it, all the meticulous controls power. Right, there you go. Time, and again, that's, that is us. That is us. Time penetrates the body, constructs the consciousness, constructs the subjectivity. Time penetrates the body and with it, and with it, all the meticulous controls of power. All right, all right, now, Now let's move to the second of the strategy. Okay, let's move to the second part of the outline. All right, let's move to chapter two, page 170. Okay, let's, chapter two, page 170. And we're gonna move to the second strategy and technique of disciplinary power. Now remember, as we start with the first and we move to the second and we move to the third, we're talking, we're, we're breaking them down in this linear way and we're talking about them individually, of course, so we can get some grasp over them. But remember, all three of these strategies and techniques of disciplinary power are happening simultaneously and they're reinforcing each other, okay? They're all happening simultaneously and they're reinforcing each other, all right? So now we're going to move from this kind of obsession with the control and routinization of space and time to the second of the disciplinary techniques and strategies. And, and Foucault loosely calls this the emergence, the emergence of architecture 
of the design of buildings, the emergence of a kind of architecture, a theory of architecture, buildings that are designed to maximize the observation of the people inside of them. Okay, so, so the second strategy is the emergence of a theory of architecture, literally, at its most basic level, a, a kind of a, a way of thinking about building buildings. How do we construct buildings, right? Remember, how do we construct enclosures and partitions, right? How do we, how do, how, so, you know, the first strategy, we got to get control over space in these enclosures. And then we can, we can, we can even get more control over space by making partitions, right? And we, we can, we can get this kind of infinite, almost, you know, quantum control of space. All right. All right. Now let's design that space, second level of the strategy. Now let's, now let's design that space in such a way that we maximize the observation of the people inside it. We maximize the observation of the prisoners. We maximize the observation of the students. We maximize the observation of the employees in the factory. We maximize the observation of the people in the bureaucracy on the 10th floor of Google, All right? And it's, not, it's not just that we're getting control of space, and it's not just that we're getting control of time and activity, now we're going to design that very space, the architecture. We're going to architecturally design the spaces and the enclosures and the partitions, the workstations, in such a way that the buildings themselves operate to maximize the observation and the surveillance of the people in them. And then through that process, and by the way, it's a lifetime process, right? That process begins in the hospital. The process begins in the elementary school. That process begins in high school. The process begins at the factory. It's through that process. Remember, as Foucault says, we are always already in, right? These apparatuses of power. We are always already in these microphysics of power, these institutions, these apparatuses, these microphysics of power. We're always already in them. We're always already in architectural spaces designed to maximize the observation of us. One, and then two, why, why is that done? What's the effect of that? It is the production of what Foucault will call a kind of one, panopticism, but, but more specifically, panoptic consciousness. And this is, if there's ever a moment where you just want to just cry, this is when we, later on, this is going to be it. And it's the, it's the kind of possibly seen, even if it's just for an intellectual exercise, consciousness itself as a panoptic experience, that, that what consciousness is in the way that it's been constructed through disciplinary power as a panoptic experience. Consciousness is a panoptic experience. So we'll talk about that later. So let's first, let's get back to the first part. Okay, so now we're talking about the second strategy of disciplinary power, the creation of architectural spaces designed to maximize the observation, to maximize the surveillance of the people inside of them. Okay, so 170, page 170. Now again, in each of the chapters, the first two pages, Foucault reminds us of the big picture, right? So we're now, we're now on part three, chapter two, the means of correct training. And in the first couple pages on page 170, he's gonna remind us of really what disciplinary power is doing overall. And then he's gonna go to the specific strategy, okay? So right in the middle, right? Right in the middle of page 170, there's this beautiful, line and it's there to remind you it, and it's very similar to a line that's on the first page of the first chapter in part three but Foucault says before he gets to the actual strategy itself he says look discipline disciplinary power makes and, and he puts makes in quotes disciplinary power makes individuals subjectivity is constructed your identity and your subjectivity is constructed. How you think of your body, how you hold your body, how you carry your body, structure of your mind, 
that's constructed. All right, again, for the, for the postmodern point of view, is there an objectively real self? No, of course not. Whatever subjectivity is from the postmodern point of view is something constructed. Constructed how? In language. As a series of human inventions about what things mean and a simultaneously an assertion of power. And disciplinary power is a particularly unique, fascinating, unique way in which certain types of people, us, are constructed. So again, he reminds us again of the, what the hell is disciplinary power in the big scheme of things doing. Disciplinary power makes individuals, makes you. It is a specific technique or techniques of a power that regards individuals as both objects and instruments of its exercise. Okay, now here's the first claim where we've seen Foucault make, some, make the argument that I've been kind of talking about playfully for a while now. For Foucault, as he analyzes disciplinary power, subjectivity is both the effect of power, this, this, these ideas, these, this language and these ideas, the enlightenment discourse operating as a human invention and assertion of power, right? Constructs, it constructs subjectivity, but it constructs a certain type of subjectivity, you and I, who then become the instruments of disciplinary power. So for Foucault, whatever the hell identity is, right? Whatever the hell subjectivity is, or agency is, or identity is, right? For Foucault, it is both. It's two things simultaneously. It is both the effect of power and that power constructs a type of subjectivity that then becomes the vehicle for its transmission. So for Foucault, subjectivity is technically the effect and vehicle of power, right? Consciousness is both the effect and the vehicle of disciplinary power, right? And that's what he means by this. It is a specific technique. Disciplinary power is a series of specific techniques that regards individuals as both objects and instruments of its exercise, right? And that's us, right? We are constructed through this disciplinary power and the type of subjectivity it constructs in us, right? We, we become the army of technicians, right? We, we become the instruments, the vehicles of the transmission of that power. And that, and that ultimately is the kind of webbing of disciplinary power and disciplinary society in general. All right, bottom of page 170. The success of disciplinary power derives no doubt from the use of simple instruments. Hierarchical observation right? The creation of architecture that is designed to maximize the surveillance of the people in it. The success of disciplinary power derives from the use of simple instruments. Hierarchical observation, normalizing judgment, and as we'll see on Tuesday at the last lecture, the combination in the examination. All right, so Bottom of page, bottom of page 170. The exercise of disciplinary power, right? One, one dimension of its exercise. The exercise of disciplinary power presupposes a mechanism that coerces by means of observation. An apparatus, an institution, an apparatus, a microphysics of power. He's always playing with these words. An apparatus in which the techniques Right? Architecture becomes an apparatus. Architecture becomes an institution, right? In which the techniques, the ability, the techniques that make it possible to see, to observe, induce effects of power. Induce effects of power. So the very way we design buildings architecturally as a way of maximizing observation functions as a form of power. Make it possible to see induce effects of power and in which conversely, 
the means of coercion make those on whom they are applied clearly visible. So again, another dimension of that reversal of visibility, right? Prior to the enlightenment, uh, you and I were invisible. No one, no one watched us really, nobody cared, nobody educated us, nobody trained us, we were invisible. We lived in the shades of power, as Foucault would say. But the enlightenment reverses the, the flow of visibility. Now in the enlightenment, it's, it's you and I that are visible. And, and interestingly enough, the people who possess power kind of fade into the background. All right. Slowly, slowly, in the course of the classical age, we see the construction of those observatories, right? Universities, schools, prisons, right? He's having fun with this, right? These are observatories of human multiplicity, right? For which the history of the science has so little good to say. All right, middle of the page. Next paragraph, 171. These observatories, these institutions, had an almost ideal model. So what's the model? What's the origin of this idea of architectural designs created to maximize observation of people? These observatories had an almost ideal model, the military camp, right? So again, this is disciplinary power begins in the prison, begins in the, begins in the military. The short-lived artificial city built and reshaped almost at will. In the perfect camp, three lines down, right? In the perfect school, in the perfect hospital, in the perfect university, in the perfect factory, in the perfect bureaucracy, in the perfect prison, in the perfect camp, all power would be exercised solely through exact observation. In the, in, 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 in the perfectly designed architectural space, power would be exercised through exact observation. Each gaze would form a part of the overall functioning of power. The old traditional square plan was considerably redefined in numeral new projects. Bottom of the page, six lines up, bottom of 171. The camp is the diagram of a power the camp is a diagram of power that acts by means of general visibility. For, as long, for a long time, this model of the camp, or at least its underlying principle, was found in urban development. Ah, oh, there we go, right? That original idea of the book. That in the Enlightenment, there are a series of these strategies that are designed first for the prison and the army, but find deployment and application throughout society. That's why the prisons look like the universities and the universities look like the factories and the factories look like the bureaucracies and all of that looks like a fucking military camp in some way. For a long time, bottom of 71, for a long time, this model of the camp or at least its underlying principles was found in urban development in the construction of working class housing estates, hospitals, asylums, prisons, ah, there's season, schools. The spiraling, the spatial nesting of hierarchical surveillance. The spatial nesting of hierarchical surveillance. Schools, hospitals, prisons, asylums, factories, bureaucracies, prisons working class housing. Next paragraph, 172. A whole problematic, a whole problematic then develops, here it is, that of an architecture, creating buildings, designing buildings, building buildings, that of an architecture that is no longer built simply to be seen or to, to be able to see the external space, 
And what he's talking about are castles, right? If you, if you, think, if you think prior to the Enlightenment and, and this, this sort of obsession with building architectural spaces that are designed to maximize the surveillance of the people in them, right? If, if you think back to the feudal ages and going back in history, you know, buildings were built for two reasons. One, to protect, right? You had these forts, you had castles, right? And, and they were designed just to protect what's inside of them and to give you a sense of observation of the external space. That's what he's talking about. Or, or, or things were built to be seen. So the aristocracy would build a castle or the aristocracy would be a big villa and the villa would be designed to show the wealth and the power and also protect that wealth and power, right? But now in the enlightenment, architecture changed. Architecture isn't just building palaces, right? To, to, to one, make visible the power and wealth of the aristocracy and to protect what's in it, it's architecture reverses. The purpose of architecture is now to build architecture that maximizes the ability to survey the people in it. And who are the people in it? Well, they're the peasants. They're the peasant children in the school. They're the peasant children at the factory. They're the peasant children or people in the prison. They're the peasant children and people wherever, in the asylum, in the hospital, the housing estates. A whole prob problematic, a whole new sort of point of view emerges. That of an architecture that is no longer built simply to be seen but to permit an internal articulated and detailed control, to render visible, to make visible, to render visible those who are inside it. In more general terms, an architecture, this is, this is some of the most beautiful lines of the whole damn book. An in more general terms, an architecture that would operate to transform individuals. So the actual design of the building itself is, is, is created to have effects on your behavior. Right? It's not just a building. You're not, you're not just walking into CSUN. You're not just walking into the hospital. You're just not walking into the school. You're not just walking into the factory. You're walking into a space that has been designed to transform and shape and guide your behavior, right? Which is, which is once, you, once you sort of set aside your metaphysical assumption that you're fucking objectively real and you occupy this time and space and you're, uh, you're the origin of will and we build buildings and we do things, once you, once you suspend that metaphysical view of agency and you come to realize that you and I are always already in a series of institutions and apparatuses, some of which are architectural, which were specifically divine to affect behavior and to produce certain types of subjectivity and consciousness. You're in buildings that were built to transform your behavior and construct your consciousness in a certain way. In more general terms, an architecture that would operate to transform individuals. To act, to act as power, to act on those at shelters, to provide a hold on their conduct, to carry, this is so beautiful, to carry the effects of power right to them, to make it possible to know them, to alter them, right? And then for me, one of the best sentences in the whole damn book, stones can make people docile and knowable. Architecture can make people docile and it can construct consciousness. That's what that means. Stones, the way you build buildings to act on the people in them. Stones can make people docile and construct their consciousness. 
three lines down. In this way, the hospital building was gradually organized as an instrument of medical action. It was to allow a better observation of patients and therefore a better calibration of their treatment. The form of the buildings by the careful separation of the patients was to create, prevent contagions, etc. Bottom of 72, last paragraph 72, now talking about schools. Similarly, the school building, CSUN, the school building was to be a mechanism for training. The building is a mechanism for training. It's not just a building to house people or, or to put people. I mean, it is that as an enclosure to be sure, but it is specifically the, the building itself is a function of the power. The building itself is a function of the training. The building itself is a function in the construction of a certain type of subjectivity. The school building was to be a mechanism for training. Bottom of the page, the very building of the school was to be an apparatus for observation. The rooms were distributed along a corridor like a series of small cells at regular intervals and officers quarters were situated so that every 10 pupils had an officer on each side. The pupils were confined to their cells throughout the night. It's like CSUN. This just described CSUN. They just described a prison. You just described an asylum. Last paragraph, 173. The perfect disciplinary apparatus, <clears throat> the perfect disciplinary apparatus would make it possible for a single gaze to see everything constantly. The perfect disciplinary apparatus would make it possible for a single gaze to see everything. One seventy five. Bottom of page one seventy five. <clears throat> the development of the school system, the increase in the number of pupils, the absence of methods for regulating simultaneously the activity of a whole class, and the disorder and confusion that followed from this made it necessary to work out a system of supervision in order to help the teacher baton cord selected from among the best pupils, a whole series of officers, intendants, observers, monitors, tutors, writing officers, receivers of, and, and by the way, that's exactly what we've done in CSUN, right? All the writing labs, all, this, all, the, all the tutoring labs, all the mentoring labs, all of these mechanisms of observation and surveillance and normalizing judgment. Bottom of 76, bottom of 76. Architecture designed to maximize the observation of the people in it. It was also organized as a multiple automatic and anonymous power. For although surveillance rests on the individuals, this is important, for though surveillance rests on individuals, right, its functioning is that of a network of relations from top to bottom, but also to a certain extent from bottom to top and laterally. This network holds the whole together and traverses it in its entirety with effects of power that derive from one another, supervisors who are perpetually supervised. The power in this hierarchical surveillance of the discipline is not possessed as a thing, this is so important, it's not possessed as a thing or transferred as a property, it functions like a piece of machinery, right? And, and again, this is critical. So when we talk about disciplinary power, this is, this is one of the core ideas of it. All right. And by the way, this is some, you've heard me say sometimes in the past that disciplinary power 
is not conspiratorial. Disciplinary power is not conspiratorial. Disciplinary power is not the Wizard of Oz. Okay? Disciplinary power is not, listen to me, is not George Orwell's 1984. Disciplinary power isn't Orwell's big brother. Disciplinary power is not the Wizard of Oz. So what the fuck am I talking about, Wizard of Oz? Right? They, they go they, on the yellow brick road, they finally get to the city to see the wizard, right? And it turns in and it turns out that the wizard is nothing but some dude behind a curtain doing all this shit. Right? It's not disciplinary power is not that. It's not conspiratorial. There's not a person behind the curtains consciously doing all of this. It's not George Orwell's 1984. Right? It's not, it's not some group of government minders and Big Brother, right? It's not conspiratorial. In disciplinary power, while there are moments of power, we're in one of them right now, while there are moments of hierarchical power, we're in one right now, I'm speaking, you're talking. I've got this stupid PhD, you're getting your BA. Right? There's a kind of power here, right? We, we can identify modalities, localities, or hierarchical power. It's real, right? It's a thing. But the power in disciplinary power, right? At the end of the day, there's no one controlling the switches. There's, there's power, whatever disciplinary power is, it's not ultimately reducible to one person or one institution, right? It is, the, it is the system itself. It's the discourse itself. So even my power, whatever, whatever, my, po whatever my local locality of hierarchical power in the classroom is, whatever it is, right? I speak, you write. You write, I grade. Whatever that, and okay, it's power. That, that locality of hierarchical power is only made possible by the discourse, a discourse called the Enlightenment, which recognizes certain types of knowledge, gives them certain types of value, and then reinforces them in the social and political and economic space. Right. And by the way, the very fact that it's, it's, it, 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 that power works like that and, that and that what shows up as hierarchical relationships of power differ in different discourses. So like I say all the time, in 10 years, when, when you see me, right, when you see me right now, you're looking at the walking dead. You're, you're there, there will not be human teachers in 15 years. And there certainly won't be professors like me in large public universities like CSUN. You're looking at the walking dead, me. Artificial intelligence, holograms, machine learning, they are going to be the new devices for the dissemination of whatever the fuck information is in 15 years. And they're gonna, that's gonna be the way it's disseminated to kids. So whatever power I have right now has this 54 year old dude with a PhD living in what's left of the great enlightenment experiment called the goddamn university, whatever power that is, whatever meaning, whatever value, whatever power that is, it's not something Nick Dungy objectively possesses. Nick Dungy is itself an effect of the broader discourse of disciplinary power. And once that discourse fades and, trans and transforms like it is, so goes my power, so goes my meaning. So, so this is what he's getting at. Architecture has been absolutely constructed to maximize the observation of the people in it. Absolutely, and that functions as power, but, but it, 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 it's part of a, a discourse itself. 
you and I are always already in relationships of power that are moving. And, and, and it's never reducible to one person or one institution. And that's what he's talking about here. This network holds the whole together and transverses it in its entirety with effects of power that derive from one another. Supervisors perpetually supervised. The power in the hierarchical surveillance of the disciplines is not possessed as a thing. That's what I mean. The power I have is not possessed as an objective thing. It's not, it's not part of my objective identity. It's not something that is objective, that's timeless and changeless. It's not possessed as a thing or transferred as a property. It functions like a machine, it functions like a system. And although it is true that it is it is, it's got a kind of a pyramid shape, that's right, I've got a boss, right? And the boss has got a boss, it's kind of got this pyramid thing. And although it is true that it is pyr pyramidal in organization, it is, the, it is the apparatus as a whole that produces power. It is the discourse itself. It is disciplinary power itself that is functioning, that produces power and distributes, creates and distributes individuals in this permanent and continuous Field. So again, as I've said, we are always already in a field of relationships of power, which have produced us and through which now operates, right? Now through which we become the vehicles. And that's it. That is what disciplinary power is. It's discursive. It's not objectively real, even though it's concrete. This enables the disciplinary power to be both absolutely indiscreet, since it is everywhere, and always alert, since by its very principle, since by its very principle, it leaves no zone of shade and constantly supervises the very individuals who are entrusted with the task of supervising, <laughs> right? And absolutely discreet, for it functions permanently and largely in science, silence. Right? And, and, and this is a fascinating thing. Power is happening all the time and in every human relationship, even in times and places and relationships that we don't think power is happening. Discipline makes possible the operation of a relational power that sustains itself by its own mechanism. There you go. Discipline makes possible the operation of a type of relational power that sustains itself by its own mechanisms. And its own mechanisms is the discourse itself. The, the mechanism are the ideas of the enlightenment discourse, are the strategies themselves. And by the way, it works so fucking well because we think those ideas are objectively true and good for us. So we don't see it as power. That's why it's discreet. You and I, if we'd never read Foucault, never read Nietzsche, never read anything about postmodernism, would view the core ideas, the philosophical, the normative, social and behavioral, and the political ideas of the Enlightenment as objectively, fairly objectively true and good for us. We would see the three strategies, the obsession with the control and routinization of space and time and activity, the creation of buildings to maximize observation of the people in them, the, the self-discipline that comes from being well-behaved and the submission to all of these exams with their norms and their expectations. We would see all those things as not only ubiquitous, but good. So we don't see any of this as power. We don't see ourselves as the objects of this power, and we don't see ourselves as the vehicles of this power.
Discipline makes possible the operation, disciplinary power. The Enlightenment discourse seen from a postmodern point of view and the disciplinary power it gives rise to makes possible the operation of a relational power that sustains itself by its own mechanisms. Thanks to the techniques of surveillance, the physics of power, the hold over the body, operate according to the laws of optics and mechanics. All right. Now, what then is the purpose of this? All right, there's two things that are happening. There's the creation of buildings designed to transform our behavior, to act on the people in them, to transform and shape their behavior and construct their consciousness. So what's the ultimate effect of all of that? Panopticism, page 200. Page 200. Panopticism. What the hell is panopticism? Page 201. Page 200. Panopticism. And this is the second part of the second strategy. What's the, what's the reason of building buildings to maximize the observation of the people in them? In addition to the things we've just said, the ultimate purpose is to induce in the people in them, the people who are being transformed and acted on by the architecture, the stones that are making people obedient and knowable, right? What's the, what's the real goal? It is, it, is to, it is to make people who are obedient and knowable in the sense that you construct panoptic consciousness. You, in, you construct as, as an element of subjectivity itself. You construct as an element of subjectivity itself, a type of consciousness that is itself awareness that it's always being watched even when it's not, and therefore becomes self-disciplining. The construction of a consciousness, and this is really important. Let me just take a step back and try to disentangle this. If you are committed to some metaphysical notion of subjectivity, Say the Enlightenment notion. Say if you interpret the Enlightenment, the philosophical ideas of the Enlightenment as metaphysically true, right? You say, well, I'm objectively free. Human beings are morally equal. I'm deeply individualistic. There's no, only Nick Dungy's Nick Dungy. And I've got these natural rights. And I've got this, this set of ideas and interests in my mind that are totally idiosyncratic to me, Right? If you adopt that conception of consciousness of subjectivity, then you think, then you think being self-disciplining is a matter of your free will and choice. You went to school, you were really smart, you learned well, you became obedient, you became self-disciplining, you became successful. You see that as a function of your will, of your own choice. In fact, in fact, some form of that view is the whole foundation of conservative, conservative economic ideology, right? The, the Darwinian and social Darwinism, the smart, the talented, right? The self-disciplining, they succeed. And the lazy and the stupid and the ignorant, they, they're the losers, right? But so if you see subjectivity as something that's objectively real, then you, you, then you see discipline, self-discipline, as something that you've chosen, something that you've achieved. But if you see consciousness from the point of view of disciplinary power and what it's doing as it's constructing consciousness, consciousness itself becomes a panoptic experience. Consciousness itself is the self that has been created to be aware 
that it is being watched all the time, even when it's not. So subjectivity isn't metaphysically true, it's panoptically constructed. So where does this come from? It comes from the prison, it comes from the panopticon. You can, in fact, you can see the panopticon in the LA County Jail. Bentham's top of 200. Bentham's panopticon is the architectural figure of this composition. We know the principle on which it was based. At the periphery, an annular building, at the center, a tower. This tower is pierced with wide windows that open onto the inner side of the ring. And there's pictures of this in the book if you can't follow what I'm saying, right? So what, was, what you do is you build a prison in such a way, it's a panopticon, it's a, it's a geometric figure. And then you got these rings and these rings and these floors, these floors and these rings. And in each of the rings, on each of the floor, there are 30 cells. And in the middle of the damn thing is a single guard tower, right? And on each level, you got one guard in the tower. And each guard in the tower can watch 30 prisoners. And then you arrange the lighting so the prisoners can't see out, but the guards can see in. So the prisoners have to assume that they're being watched even when they're not. That's what panopticism is. Right? That's what, that's what organizing a kind of hierarchical and panoptic surveillance does. It induces in the prisoner. It induces in the student. It induces in the factory worker. It induces in the, in the person in the hospital. The awareness that he or she is always being watched when they're not. And so middle of 201. I'll let you read the arch architectural part. Let's just get to what it does. 201, middle of the page. First paragraph, 201, middle of the page. Hence the major effect of the panopticon. What, what, what's the purpose of this? What's the effect of it? To induce in the inmate, to create in the inmate a structure of consciousness. To induce in the inmate a state of conscious and permanent visibility that assures the automatic functioning of power. To arrange things, to arrange things that the surveillance is permanent in its effects, even if it's discontinuous in its action. Right? You are aware that you're always being watched and you become so aware that you're being watched that you behave even when you're not being watched. That's what that means to arrange things that the surveillance is permanent in its effects. You are aware that you're always possibly being watched. And you're so aware that you're always possibly being watched that you start behaving, that you start watching yourself. And you become so good at watching yourself that you don't even have to be watched anymore. In fact, the, the, the inmates become so damn good at this that you can just take the guards out of the fucking tower. And the prison is just a metaphor for the entire society and your own consciousness. To induce in the individual a state of conscious and permanent awareness of visibility that assures the automatic functioning of power. To arrange things that the surveillance is permanent in its effects. That's what, that's what self-discipline is. You've, you have, you've become so self-disciplined that, that the effects of permanent, of surveillance are permanent. Nobody has to fucking watch you anymore for the most part. That, to arrange things that the surveillance is permanent in its effects, even if it is discontinuous in its action. That the perfection of power should tend to render its actual exercise unnecessary. And that's the purpose of panoptic consciousness. We create disciplinary power, constructs a concept, a, a structure of consciousness that builds people who, in a way, are so self-disciplined that that, that real that in, in a weird way, the application of power or 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 coercion is no longer necessary. 
to render that the perfection of power should tend to render its actual exercise unnecessary. That this architectural apparatus should be a machine for creating and sustaining a power relation independent of the person who exercises it. In short, that the inmates should be caught up in a power situation of which they are themselves the bearers. And that's what Foucault means when he says, you and I are both prisoners in and guard over our own consciousness. Consciousness is panoptic. Enlightenment consciousness is generalized panopticism. But we don't see it that way. In fact, we see it as something morally good. Oh, I'm just self-disciplined. I'm always watching myself. I'm always behaving myself. I'm always on time. I'm not doing stupid shit. You don't need to watch me. You don't need to coerce me. You don't need to remind me. I'm a fucking robot. Right? And, and by the way, because we don't see that from the point of, of postmodernism, we call that we call that a moral virtue. We call that good. That's good. It's what you need to do to be successful. power. You and I have panoptic consciousness. Consciousness is itself the awareness that you've always been watched. You're always being watched. And you, and, and as you, as you go from, from the hospital, the elementary school, to the high school, the university, to the factory, to your bureaucracy, it constructs a subjectivity, a mode of subjectivity. That, that's what it is. It's panoptic. You watch yourself as a, as a structure and function of power slash subjectivity. All right. Have a fabulous day, everybody. We will um, meet on Tuesday for the last lecture, the third the third, it gets even better. Don't quit on me yet. Uh, on Tuesday, we will do the third and the last of um, the disciplinary powers, this, the creation and deployment of these examinations. And we'll talk about that. And then we'll have a complete vision of disciplinary power and how it is that you are both prisoner in and guard over your own consciousness. Thank Love you, you guys. Sir. Thank you, Dungeon. Yep. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Nick. See yep. you next week. Professor. Love you guys. See you Tuesday. Wait, wait, Professor? Yep. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, you said Panatic?